The Climate Project, a changing New England, is brought to you by National Grid. I can tell you that global warming is real. I can tell you that it is almost certainly human caused. It's hard for the average person to really get his head around what is climate change. I think our fishermen are at the front line. It's, uh, it's definitely one of my biggest fears. What's going to happen is that many of our tree species, many of our bird species are going to die out. How much has the sea level come up since the glacier retreated? Three or 400 feet. Wow, this is unprecedented. Essentially, we are burdening not just our grandchildren, but hundreds of future generations. Welcome to historic Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. You know, 2017 looks like it goes down on record as the third warmest year for the globe. In fact, the top five warmest years have all happened since the year 2010. Yet here we are, we've had sub-zero temperatures this winter, we've already had a blizzard, and this ice thick at Walden Pond. So how do we put all that together? How does this fit in with the changing climate? For the next half hour, our NBC10 Boston Early Warning Weather Team will take a deep dive into the climate science and specifically how it applies here in New England. How has a changing climate been impacting our wildlife, the land, the waters, and more importantly, or at least equally so, how is it impacting all of us? Heat waves, cold snaps, blizzards, floods, storm surge, and historic hurricanes. Are these really examples of climate change or just extreme weather? Take an individual, each is a day-to-day -day weather event. Climate is the weather over decades or longer. So if we see a change in the frequency or intensity of weather events over the long haul, now that's climate change. Boston College assistant professor Dr. Jeremy Shacken specializes in paleoclimate research. I can tell you that global warming is real. Everything that we look at in the climate system tells us it's gotten hotter in the last hundred years and it's continuing to get hotter. Um, I can tell you that it is almost certainly human caused. Dr. Richard Premack is a professor of biology at Boston University and his laboratory researches the effect of a changing climate at Walden Pond. In Thoreau's time, Walden Pond melted in the spring. The ice on Walden Pond melted in the spring around April 1st. It was very variable, but on average April 1st. And now the ice on the pond is melting around March 15th. The trees are now leafing out about two weeks earlier than in Thoreau's time. And so this means there are huge changes in the whole ecology of the Concord. What's going to happen is that many of our tree species, many of our butterfly species, many of our bird species are going to die out. Our weather data shows major changes change too. Average first and last frost dates have shown an incredible increase of nearly two months of frost-free growing for most of New England over the last four decades. The idea our world is changing so dramatically can be a tough pill to swallow. A natural response is to question it. It is an idea. It's a happening. It's an image that we have never seen. So it requires a combination of imagination and faith and then some kind of willingness to trust the scientists. Dr. Donna Canavan is an assistant professor of psychology at Boston College and sheds light on why the convincing data of a warming planet doesn't always meet a receptive audience. I think it's hard for the average person to really get his head around what is climate change and what are its virtually inevitable consequences. I do think it's partly a matter of trust or faith to, to do that. Boston College political science professor Dr. David A. Deese sees these elements of acceptance and denial at work in American society. We were a world leader really in, in national and international environmental policy under uh, Nixon of all people and of course in the late 60s and early 70s and uh, we're doing pretty well. And then the U.S. kind of slid out of our leading international position by the early to mid 1980s. And we didn't really ever return there, particularly on climate change, um, until uh, Obama ran on climate change in uh, 2008. Now in 2018, the tides may be turning again with regard to policy on climate change in the United States, but modern data is more abundant and compelling than ever before. One standout of our talks with both doctors Premack and Shacken is how strongly both highlighted a rising sea level and the impact on Boston. Boston's one of the five lowest lying cities in the country. Right, we're right on the harbor, so add a couple more feet of sea level to the ocean, which is the kind of thing we're expecting in the decades to come. It's huge impacts, huge impacts for a city, right? 
And that's not just Boston, that's up and down the whole New England coastline. Meteorologist Chris Gloniger takes a deeper dive into what may be a very personal problem for New Englanders. Boston College professor and geophysicist Dr. Carling Hay studies sea level rise. Right now, we're pretty much set to have about six inches of sea level rise by 2030 for the city of Boston. After about 2050, how much sea level rise we see really depends on what we do to reduce our emissions. Dr. Hay says there's no way to prevent the six inch rise in sea level. She says we need to learn lessons from New York City during Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was four feet above their 100 year flood height. And we all saw the damage from that. Uh, the floods that we've seen in Boston are a few inches above our 100 year flood height. So um, what that type of event here would look like is very, very terrifying. I'm at the Blue Line Aquarium T-Stop and on January 4th, water was pouring down these stairs at the height of high tide during the nor'easter. That was the worst flood recorded in Boston's history. Prior to the nor'easter, we've seen flooding here. In fact, since 1969, there have been 137 flood events recorded here at Boston Harbor, but the floods have been pretty much up Long Wharf into the chart house, only causing a minor inconvenience. However, the frequency of those floods has been going up. 1969 is the halfway point of the Boston Harbor Tidal Gauge, installed in 1921. Prior to 69, there were only 42 flood events. So we really need to understand you know, where that water is going to go in the city, um, especially with all the development that's happening these days. Um, that's really going to change some of the flood patterns in some of the areas. As a scientist, does it concern you that one of the areas that is seeing the largest amount of growth is the seaport district? <laughs> yes, that does concern me. That's, um, that area is in the 100 year floodplain. Um, the flood heights are only gonna increase going forward in time and there is tremendous development in that neighborhood. For a city which was partially built on backfill, the future could be grim. We could see about two to four feet of sea level rise by 2100, or we could see five to seven feet. Uh, that part is really uncertain at this time. That worst case scenario is if we don't cut emissions and the melting of the Arctic sea ice doesn't slow. As bad as the flooding was on January 4th, it was still considered only a moderate flood. Major flood stage would have been a foot higher. It's also important to remember this nor'easter wasn't a superstorm or a hurricane. Two events which Boston is long overdue. You know, rising sea levels, warming water, it doesn't just create a problem at the coast, but also deep in the ocean. Our meteorologist Michael Page takes us to Cape Cod, where the life of a fisherman is changing. I fish a lot of different species. Willie Hatch knows these waters well. Striped bass, tuna, cod, haddock. His livelihood depends on it. I fished in Cape Cod my whole life. But things here are changing. The surface of the ocean warming nearly two degrees Fahrenheit since 1950, significantly faster than the global average. This past winter, we had temperature anomalies that were up to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit there. Glenn Gaworkowitz of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute studies the changes, partially caused by warm Gulf Stream water invading cooler water near the coastline. We can see clear evidence of Gulf Stream water getting onto the continental shelf more frequently. Those more frequent incursions of warmth impact Impacting Willie's catch. What we've seen down south of the Cape is a lot of the fish that have been based sort of more in the mid-Atlantic range have pushed farther north. It's not just the type of fish he's catching, but when he's catching them. We've been able to fish uh, later in November, December, even into January, January. Owen Nichols from the Center for Coastal Studies works with fishermen to track those shifts. I think our fishermen are at the front lines of climate change and fishermen often see changes in those distributions before we're able to detect them with our traditional fishery surveys and things like that. For fishermen, that's a problem. Strict catch limits can't keep up with the fish movements. I think fisheries management needs to adapt quicker. Uh, to account for that. Until regulators can keep up with the changes, researchers like Nichols are trying to help. But this is a complex issue. It's not just warming. The ocean is also becoming more acidic as it absorbs more carbon dioxide. 
it's, uh, it's definitely one of my biggest fears. Acidity impacts how things like lobsters develop shells, and as the trend continues, even more. If it affects the plankton, that could affect almost every food web there is in the ocean. But fishermen like Willie are tough and unwilling to let a New England tradition slip away. It is what it is. We need to adapt to it. Still ahead, the shifting shores of Cape Cod and what it means to future generations. You know, for a long time now, it seems like just the subject of climate change sparks this visceral debate inside of folks. Why is it happening? Is it really happening? And is there anything that we can do about it? Our meteorologist Pete Bouchard takes us to the Harvard Museum of Natural History, where those very questions are front and center. Earth's surface is vast and complex. At any one time, the forcings of ocean, air, sun, and humans drive the climate system. Simplification of the process is a delicate matter and one prone to missteps. New approaches to the study of climate change have enabled climatologists to more accurately peer into the past to see how much mankind has changed the planet. One of the primary jobs of Dr. Daniel Schrag of Harvard is in researching a deep database of Earth's own natural history, paleoclimatology. You don't need a model to tell you that this is happening. And Dr. Schrag's data about our oceans is alarming. If you think of the energy that's trapped from adding greenhouse gases to the planet, 90% of that energy is going into heating the ocean. Just a few percent is going into heating the surface temperature. A few percent is going into melting ice. The best metric of that is actually sea level rise. So in fact, rising sea level is global warming. It, rep it is because of the warming of the ocean, which is 90% of the global warming effect. So what is thermal expansion? Well, just about everything around us moves and contracts according to temperature. Railroad tracks, for instance, will buckle in the summer due to the heat, causing train derailments. Water is really no different. It expands as it warms. Thermal expansion of the ocean is going to continue, but the real problem is sea level rise from melting ice caps. Once we start to melt Greenland or Antarctica, the question is, can we actually stop it? Is it reversible? In Antarctica, the answer may be no, but essentially we are burdening not just our grandchildren, but hundreds of future generations into the future. And that's where some people simply tune out. The overwhelming task or outright disbelief molds our perception of what to do about the problem. Unfortunately, conflict and debate then take over. People really like evidence they can see with their own eyes, their direct personal experiences. I can't agree with you because you're a professor at Harvard you're one of those tree-hugging liberals who likes big taxes and big government. You're not my tribe. I therefore can't believe you. It doesn't matter what you say. Essentially, this is the nagging issue we must overcome to reach a consensus on what to do about global warming. Of course, climate change isn't a recent trend. We've seen its impact for thousands of years. Our meteorologist Tim Kelly takes us to Cape Cod, where the rising waters are slowly changing the landscape every day. Ask anyone near the ocean, is climate change real? The answer is a resound yes. Is climate change new? No. Though it may seem like a long time in human years, the sandy shores of Cape Cod are only a few thousand years old. But ask any student of geology, how old is that? Geologically, it was yesterday, 10,000 years. To us, sounds like a long time, but when you think the Earth has been here for billions of years, this Cape Cod is a very, very new geological phenomenon. A retired engineer, Gilbert volunteers here because of his passion for the outdoors and teaching kids. He tells the story of how immense pressure from a two-mile-thick ice mass pushed millions of tons of Earth south from northern New England to its resting point that is now the Cape and Islands. You have to make it fun. You take them out and you show them the tides or you show them a rock. There's a huge boulder down here, big as a garage. And you say, how did that boulder get here? 
we tell them there was a glacier and we, we look at some of the rocks or we look at the beach and I tell them, where do you live? And they say, well, I live in New Hampshire. Some of this sand came from New Hampshire. But the shape of the Cape is nothing like it was when the glacier first melted away. Earlier, it was a frozen tundra with mammoths wandering around. Woolly mammoths here Woolly in Cape Cod? Woolly mammoths right here. 10,000 years ago, it was a great big plain. Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket were hills on a sandy plain. How much has the sea level come up since the glacier retreated? Three or 400 feet. Wow, so ocean rise is not a new thing. It's been going on for 10, 12,000 years. Just three, four years ago, we would have been underneath a dune standing right here. This tree was on a bluff. That's how fast erosion is happening on Cape Cod. There's a lot of layers, and those are the layers that were deposited by the glacier and then have been eroded by the ocean moving its way in. One thing about the erosion, it's like time traveling. That's recent, this is a while back, and then you go back, oh, I don't know, hundreds or even thousands of years, and look at this. Those leaves have not seen light in centuries. When the, when the glaciers backed up, this was a much bigger place, and there was probably a freshwater swamp there. Cape Cod has been eroding since, it, since the glaciers stopped dropping it, so it's, it's moving, it's getting thinner. How does that make you feel as a, as a resident? That, are you nervous about it? I don't think it's in the time scale that we need to worry about. If I lived on the ocean, yes, but I don't. I live 100 feet above, so I'm figuring that one of my descendants will have waterfront property, and one of their descendants will probably be living on an island. That is a sentiment shared by most of us who live here. You know, so much is going on right here in New England to study climate change in our own backyard. Coming up next, meteorologist Jackie Layer takes us to a program that's ensuring the next generation is ready to create their own change. So we hear about warming temperatures in the Arctic and in Alaska, right? But that is so far away. How does that compute? How does it impact us? Well, meteorologist Michael Page goes to the Woods Hole Research Center now, where some of their research says this may impact the air we breathe. Hundreds of miles away from the tundra, this is from a place in southwest Alaska. Sue Natale carefully studies permafrost, the frozen layer of soil found in places like Alaska and Russia. The permafrost region stores a lot of carbon. It stores, has, holds twice as much carbon than is in the atmosphere. And much of that carbon is currently locked away, frozen in permafrost. But there's a problem. We talk a lot about trying to keep global average temperatures you know, below you know, two degrees Celsius increase, and the Arctic has already passed that. As the permafrost thaws with the warming, the once trapped greenhouse gases get released. We're starting to see the Arctic um, shifting from a carbon sink to a carbon source. Each of these jars in the Woods Hole Research Center lab contains a permafrost sample, Natali measuring the gases released. Our projections for the permafrost region is that they're basically going to be, their emissions are going to be on par with the current rates of U.S. emissions. An alarming prediction. It's no longer good enough to stop adding CO2 to the atmosphere. We need to pull a lot more out. Removing carbon dioxide and lowering its impact on climate change is a main focus of Philip Duffy, the research center's executive director. We're a very science-focused organization, but we really are about having Impact. The research center calculates how much carbon is stored in soil and forest, working with countries like Brazil and Malaysia to predict where even more of this natural storage could occur if land is converted away from agriculture. So what lies ahead for all of us when it comes to our changing climate? Our meteorologist Jackie Layer introduces us to one program that's working to make sure the next generation is ready to create change. Over 160 years ago, Henry David Thoreau called Walden Pond home for two years, two months, and two days. During that time, he documented plant and wildlife species, flower blooms, leaf drop, unknowingly laying the foundation for climate and citizen scientists for generations, including the next. 
the data doesn't matter unless you understand how to collect it and why you have to collect it that way. Under the guidance of an Austin-based nonprofit organization, high school students interested in climate science, like Griffin, can contribute to a larger database of research all before they step on a college campus. In 1989, Earthwatch identified this changing climate as something worthy of studying. And a little bit later, we actually created a whole package program on climate change. And we have projects all over the globe that are looking at how this manifests itself in different ways. The idea is to pair citizens with scientists to conduct environmental research. Griffin, along with a group of students and citizen scientists, traveled across the world to Andorra to study the signatures and impacts of climate change. We have more than 40 different research expeditions around the world, everywhere from the Peruvian Amazon to Mongolia to the Andorran Pyrenees, where the Lincoln Sudbury High School students went. On an unseasonably warm and windy November afternoon, we shadowed Dr. Stan Ruhlman and the group of Lincoln Sudbury High School students to see some of the signatures of a changing climate in the wooded land behind the high school. That's one of the things about citizen science in general is that it increases the number of hands out there collecting data, or eyes or ears listening. Climate change, including shifts in temperature, early onset of spring or winter can have major impacts on local plants as well as their enemies. In this region, some of the things might be, you know, those invasive species. So some species might be thriving with these conditions that can change the overall ecology of the entire system. So for the next generation of scientists, it's a good opportunity for them to be really on the ground floor of doing that and understanding how what they're doing now might not give a lot of information, but it's going to help us see how things change over time. So we brought you so much on climate, but remember that climate is weather over a really long period of time, like decades and decades. The day-to-day -day weather, that's what we bring you in our NBC10 Boston newscast and our early warning weather exclusive 10-day forecast. We're the only ones in New England to offer it. We've heard from more and more of you that it's helping out, planning out weddings, days off, work days even. We'll keep that forecast coming to you in all of our weather broadcasts. There is so much more to share about weather and climate and the part we love making that connection to here at home in New England. That's what we're going to continue to do for you on our early warning weather team of NBC 10 Boston, NECN and Telemundo Boston. Do you have an idea for us? We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email programming at NBCBoston.com. In the meantime, thank you for joining our team. The Climate Project, a changing New England, is brought to you by National Grid.